Tonight we're in Newport, and welcome to Question Time. And a big welcome to you, as always, at home, and welcome to our audience here who are going to put questions to our panel who don't yet know what those questions are. Our panel tonight, the Conservative Defence Minister, Anna Subri, Labour's Shadow Education Minister, Roshanara Ali, Clyde Cymru's leader in Westminster, Elvin Cluid, the columnist and freelance journalist, Melanie Phillips, and the novelist and food critic, Jay Rayner. Thanks. I'd like to start with a question from Cynthia Jennings, please. Why is RBS paying bonuses when they've lost money? RBS, the Royal Bank of Scotland, owned by us, 83%, lost 8 million, over 8 billion rather, this year, paying half a million pounds in bonuses. Why are they paying these bonuses? Jay Rayner. Because they're bankers and they behave like bankers. Uh, we... we... We need banks. We've always needed banks, just not the kind we've got. Um, and the, the surprise that greets uh, the bonus uh, season when it comes round mystifies me slightly because it's what they've always done, even when they're losing large amounts of money. What they will say is, if we don't pay bonuses, we don't get the right people. If we don't get the right people, we won't make any money. They're not making any money anyway. Um, but it's, it's the way the banking system works, and we have to decide what kind of a banking system we want. But we heard this, um, the, the boss of RBS today justifying the 500 million bonuses on exactly those grounds. Where are the people going to go if they kicked, you know, where, where, what other banks are there to go to? Uh, is there a huge demand for bankers? I, I suspect there is a huge demand because... So it's they, justified they, then? Well, there is an argument, but they're all floating between each other. And you look at all those banks and... It, the main issue for RBS is that they have continued trying to have an investment banking arm at the same time as a retail banking arm. And investment banking is a very nice phrase for playing bingo. Um, and they've been playing bingo with the taxpayers' money for a, for a very long time. And they're not very good at it. OK. Are you shocked, Anna Subri, by... Look, I mean, the, look, this bonus culture is completely lost on me, if I'm completely honest about it. I've never been paid a bonus in my life. Now, some may say that's because I've never deserved a bonus in my life, but I've never worked in, in, in a business or an industry where they paid bonuses. So it's a bit lost on me, but I do understand why, and I'm pleased that we've put a cap of £2,000 on the RBS bonuses. Um, and they do it because the reputation... Hang on, £2,000? on the amount of actual money. So yeah, how's he spending you, 500 million pounds on you can bonuses? Buy, you can buy shares and then you can cash in your shares and that is one of the ways... The cap's 200% of income. Oh, look, um, I'm not going to sit here and defend our banks when they do these things, which do seem incomprehensible. But what I will say is this. I, I have no doubt that the reputation of our banks is such possibly with great merit, that they do have problems actually recruiting and often in retaining people. Uh, and so I can understand why uh, they will pay out these bonuses. Okay. I, you say over there. Sorry, I come to you in a minute. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I think if you look at the, the banking industry in context, they've been bailed out to the tune of 1.2 trillion over the last few years. We're having austerity forced on us across Europe as a result of that. And the industry still hasn't been reformed. There is still no ring fence between investment banks and retail banks and they're still able to you know, engage in casino practices uh, with our money. Uh, the bankers have also been responsible for fixing LIBOR. They've missold PPI. They've um, brought small businesses to their knees mm. through um, dubious selling practices on interest rate swaps. Yeah. I think it's time that we had some proper legislation in this country and across Europe to regulate the banking okay. industry. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. and, and, and... Uh, 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 and Cynthia Jennings, who asked the question, what, what do you think? What's your view of it? I just think if they, um, if across the whole board, if nobody got paid bonuses and got paid a reasonable salary, then the, the bankers wouldn't be uh, able to jump and hop to wherever they want to go. OK. Um, Roshana. Roshnara. Roshnara. Well, I think that 
for a government-owned bank that was part partially owned, that was bailed out by the taxpayer, it's completely irres irresponsible to give those sorts of bonuses. And at a time when you've got people queuing up in food banks, high levels of poverty, uh, I think the government needs to step up and take action against this kind of uh, reward, which is completely unjustified when everyone else is suffering in this country. So what would you do? How would you do it? Your party's you, in power. You, you, you didn't party's regulate the banks. You had 13 years to regulate the banks. You had 13 your, years to your sort out the banks. Power. So you should take some responsibility. You should take some responsibility. But we have done. We, we've, intru we've introduced a tax. We've taken the LIBOR funding, for example, and we're giving that now to our charities connected with, um, with, with our, our wounded and our injured and our, our armed forces personnel. We've taken all this tough action. We've cleared up the is mess that, is that, that why we inherited this, is after that why, 13 is that years why your today, party and your is, government. Is that why, Anna, today people are getting bonuses? A government, partially owned government bank is getting... Uh, people well, are I, getting I, bonuses. I she says, what's your policy? What would, what would your policy we, be? We, we, wait, wait, hang on. Let's just hear what sorry. Labour's policy is. We, we've made it absolutely clear that there should be a tax on bankers' bonuses. That money should be used to get young people back to work. Nearly a million young people are out of work. That is unacceptable. And your government should act to stop this you've kind spent of irresponsible that tax behavior. 11 times. Melanie you've made Phillips. 11 sets of promises. Melanie. Well, I hesitate to come between these um, warring parties, but I think that both, if I can be sort of uh, even handed about this, I think that both um, governments, both Labour and Tory parties, um, are just very frightened once they're in government of, as it were, driving money away, particularly from London. And it's a source of, I think, great regret to many of us that uh, much of the, uh, the, uh, the economic activity, uh, we, we, we measure our, the progress of this country uh, by the wealth of the city of London. And it's almost like it's become a kind of fetish, you know, that, we, that, that this is where we are strongest in making money out of money. Isn't that true, though? Well, it is true, but it's... Well, then what it's do you do about it if it's true and it's where our money comes from? Because it would be very nice if this country was making things again oh, well, and actually that. making... <laughs> not, not, not making money out of money. And how now, do you achieve I, that? Hang on, hang on. I do think that... Not they, for long. I, I do think... Well, what, what, why should it be not, not for long? This is a council of despair. I don't believe that Britain can never make things again. Um, but I, I do actually think that there is something a bit unpleasant about the whole sort of fat cattery obsession. You know, if someone's got a lot of money, then he shouldn't have it almost by definition. So I am a bit concerned about that. But I do think also that the RBS, you know, it's, as people have said, it's taxpayers' money. The taxpayer has bailed out this bank. Uh, this bank and other banks have done a great deal of harm uh, to the economy, to ordinary people. Ordinary people have suffered. They do seem to show no sense of, of, of uh, not responsibility, but even a sense of acknowledgement of the enormity of what they have done. Right. You say in the pink shirt. It's not just unacceptable that these people are doing this. It's just unbelievable that they can display such immense greed. Yep. What I would like to see are the two governments, the former government and the current government, who fail to curb these people. They're a powerful group of people. They need both parties to work together to curb the greed of what is an extremely avaricious group of people who are the true villains of our depression. Okay. And, and you. Yes. It's Person one, too long. Yeah. It's, it's one thing to say that the Labour government didn't uh, regulate against the banks for 11 years, but you still haven't. You've been, you're in government now, and you still haven't. But we have. And I'll pick up on <coughs> Melanie's point as well. It's not that they've got a lot of money, it's that they don't deserve that money. Yeah. Well, <coughs> you say they don't deserve it, and I mean, I would... I would sort of agree with you when it comes to the RBS, but there is a kind of mood in the country that no one who has a lot of money deserves it. And, you know, and this is very subjective. At what point do we say that person doesn't deserve it? I think this is a very dangerous road to go at, down. At the point when a, a bank is earning a, a hundred times a cleaner's wage, that's when we say that's enough. Yes. Well, who says that's enough? You? I mean, you know, what, who draws the line and on what basis is that line drawn? Because you may say we've, that we've someone got, earning much less than that... We've got vast inequality in this it. country. I can't believe it that you're, you're backing bankers on this. I've, okay. I'm huge not, inequality in this I'm country. Not back, I'm not backing <coughs> bankers in these bonuses. I've said very clearly that I think when it comes no, to taxpayers' money... No, not the bonuses, money, the pay, the, the huge pay that they all right. get. Elvin, Elvin Hood. It's indefensible. Well, Elvin. You know, some, some people... Um, 
actually blame the banks for everything, but hearing news as we did today, I'm not surprised that we blame the banks for everything because they're actually taking us for a ride. Part of my function is to try and negotiate with banks for small loans for small businesses in my patch. Mm -hmm. They are closing viable businesses down at the same time as they're pushing uh, money into their bankers' pockets. Now, if it's the argument that uh, if you don't overpay them disgustingly, they'll go away and work elsewhere, OK, the way to deal with that, in my view, is to have a pan-European ruling all the European countries come together and say, we're not having it. And so, if they want to make an exodus for the, for the Far East, good luck to them in that. But can I just say this much as well? There has been an attempt to uh, deal with them, but it's not working. For example, HSBC have announced uh, this week that they'll be given, giving similar bonuses to their top people, but calling it uh, an extra salary. Exactly. So it won't be a bonus, it'll be an increase in salary. Mm. But if you don't do it on a pan-European basis, it simply will not work, in my view. Mm. I'm, I'm not an advocate for bankers. Um, <laughs> none of my best friends are bankers. But I think we need to inject some realism here. Uh, the whole of the global free market system is invested in banking. All your pensions are invested in banking, your mortgages. We have built a system on banking. The idea that we have it on a pan-European scale, it's not going to change anything. Yes, it is. Uh, it, it's, it is. It's, it's, they will move to the far east, they will no, move no, to the states, they will move to Switzerland. The well, to get the agreement what, in the first what, place. well, it might do, but it's worthwhile, in my view, otherwise they'll just continue taking us for a ride. That's the point. Uh, I mean, the European Union come together and discuss... I was in a conference in Athens a fortnight ago. We were discussing various things. Why don't we get together, prioritise this issue and deal with it on All a right. European basis. All right, we'll move on now, because we've got a lot of questions tonight. Thank you, Elvin. Uh, you can join in this debate, uh, Twitter or text, our hashtag BBCQT. You can follow us at BBC Question Time, or you can text comments to 83981. The red button will tell you what other viewers are saying. A question from Jonathan Sherwood, please. Jonathan Sherwood. Should the deals made with the IRA still provide immunity from prosecution for alleged terrorists. This, of course, in the light of the Downey <laughs> case, which came before the courts this week. Anna Subri, should the deals made with the IRA still provide immunity for prosecution? You'll forgive me if I sound a bit like the lawyer that I used to be before I got elected in 2010, but it depends on the nature of the promise that was made. Now, Downey should never, in, in any event, be made anything like the promise that he was made. Why? Because there was, uh, first of all, there was clear evidence of involvement by him in ex an extremely serious um, bomb explosion that caused people to be murdered. But in any event, there was also a warrant out for his arrest because of the evidence <coughs> against him for this heinous uh, attack uh, and this awful crime. And there was a warrant out, and all they had to do, which they... I'm assuming they didn't do, and this is what the judicial, this judge-led inquiry will discover. They only had to f find out from the Met whether or not there was, there was a warrant outstanding against any of these 183 of them. They should have made those checks. I'm assuming that they did and something happened. But if they had done and if they'd got the proper information, then they would never have given him this letter that enabled him, therefore, to come to this country mm. on the basis that but there were what no are, warrants out for him. What arrest. are these letters, anyway? Because I see that the Northern Ireland Secretary says today these letters don't amount to immunity or exemption or amnesty from arrest. I, I so think what are these letters about? Well, uh, there are and, two sets. and your government has been issued yeah, as well as the previous There were one. two sets of letters. There was the first set of letters which were issued in 0708, um, and there are about 183 of those, and Downey is one of those letters. Um, and these are letters that say to people uh, that, that there are no, there's no reason to believe that there is anything, there is a, are any warrants out against you. Um, and Downey's position seems to have been um, in relation to the fact that having come into this country, he is then arrested and effectively, from what I can gather, the reason why the judge stayed the indictment, stopped all the proceedings, was because effectively the state had said to him, we will not arrest you if you come into the but country. But that's what you're doing with these other letters. But the second set of letters, and I haven't seen the contents of them, and that's what Theresa Villiers is referring to, uh, and we have to, uh, to <coughs> accept that she has seen the content of them, and she says they don't amount to a promise not to prosecute. Well, now, what's the point be, of the letters in that Well, case? I don't know, but it oh. may be... No, forgive me, because it may be that these letters are different. And, uh, uh, I mean, Elvin and I, we are both lawyers, so we have 
and the, an understanding of the peculiarities. And I accept it is often very difficult to explain and for people to understand how a promise by the state to a man like Downey, who is charged of very serious offences, right. with evidence against him, we end up having to stay the indictment. So it is the question terrible. is, should the deals made, and these were clearly deals made with the IRA, Peter Hain has described them as that, one. should they provide immunity from prosecution? Elvin, no, you say well, you're a lawyer too. Can you, can yeah, you answer that? As I understand it, and I was listening very, very carefully to Dominic Grieve in the House the other day when he went through it very carefully, as he would. He's a very fine lawyer. Uh, what he was saying is that these letters to which Anna refers now uh, were letters which said, uh, we are not currently interested in any misdoings that you might have done. And that's about all. They were a snapshot in time. So I agree with Anna. What we need to do, I think, is to... I don't think you can withdraw them because it's not relevant anymore. But whether there's a case to investigate each and every one of these 183 people again, I don't know. But I want to say this. Uh, all the parties in Northern Ireland were furious about this, and I can understand that because of the nature of the awful crime that this man is alleged to have uh, perpetrated. Um, having said that, evidence is now coming out that the policing board in Northern Ireland, which comprised of every party in the Northern Irish uh, political system, were aware of these letters some time ago. In fact, as back, uh, 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 back in 2010, if not before. So, it's not something that's certainly been sprung on them. But, but the question is, should they provide immunity? Supposing more evidence it's comes up. It's not immunity, David. It's well, at the time. Well, what's the point of the letter? Well, I don't point, understand what well, the, the point, letter's about. The point of the letter at the time was an interpretation of the peace agreement where they said well, that at, can you finish? Yeah. at this moment in time we are not interested in you as being a potential uh, defendant. Why would you write that to somebody? Because, What's the well, because it? it was in order to carry through parts of the Belfast Agreement. That's can what I make it was. a more general, a more I, general point? Yes. Well, it was Nothing anybody in this room says tonight is going to make the pain of the loss of people who lost people in the Troubles any oh, absolutely, better. Absolutely, absolutely. Cool. Uh, nor is it actually going to make it any worse. If you've lost someone in a terrorist atrocity, um, it, it's still a, a deep and dark wound. But war is hard, peace is even harder. And at the time when the negotiations were going on, uh, those who issued these letters thought they had a chance. The thing that is slightly, I don't want to say distressing, if this had never come to light, if, the, uh, if there hadn't been uh, the warrant held by Scotland Yard, if this turned up 20 years down the line, it would end up as a footnote yes. to the history of peace in Northern Ireland. Justice is a very, very important well, thing, but so, so sure. is peace. I'm not so All right. sure. You said in the spectacles there. Perhaps it's not Peter Robinson that should um, be threatening to resign, but some of the people that helped draft the letters in the first place. Okay. And, and you, sir, over there. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, if you are creating a peace process, and I think this is part of the point that you were, you were bringing up a second ago, you have to be able to trust the other side's word. The second that we start going back against promises that are made, how are we ever going to be able to create peace in the future so if no one is going to trust our government's so, word? So, so despite what, uh, what uh, Theresa Villiers says, you think these letters are a promise not to prosecute? I can't say what the letters actually see. None of That's us can. We've not, we've not well, seen well, it. Well, we, do know, if, we, do, we do know what the letters okay. say, because Dan has said what the letters okay. say. No, that, if, if the letters, no. No, if the letters no, themselves no, state that there is a promise against prosecution. And again, I'm not saying that they do. And obviously, the situation is a, a disgusting situation in the first place. But if that is what the letter says, if we are, as a country are ever going to negotiate peace, people have to be able to believe in the promises we make. Okay. The second we start going against those promises, our credibility as a peacemaking country is destroyed. Do you agree with him, Melanie? <laughs> well, it... <laughs> I don't agree with this gentleman because the argument that he's making, which I think is, you know, it has a lot of power behind this argument, is basically the end justifies the means. That, you know, you do bad things in the interests of a greater good. The greater good in this case, I think this is what you're saying, sir, the greater good in this case was peace in Northern Ireland. But, you see, we can see from today's um, amazing jitteriness by the government and, you know, the threat of the dissolution of the power-sharing executive that the peace is very fragile, the peace is conditional. I'm Hang not... on, just, just a minute, may, may I just finish my point? The peace is conditional. The fear is that if this power-sharing executive collapses, 
we will go back to violence. So, so, so it's, it's like a sort of protection racket. Now, the point about this, these letters, as I understand it, is this. It's not a promise, it's not I, sorry, immunity. I, I, just, I just want to pick up one thing, because I think you're missing my point. It's not just about the peace in, the peace in Ireland. It is a much larger issue. We're not talking about just a time capsule of one event. We deal with international incidents, <coughs> terrorist organisations all around the world. Right. If we're saying in this one case it's acceptable to say actually promises we made to create peace can be broken just because they've come to light in a certain way. Right. All of a sudden, any promise we make in the future I becomes understand. incredible. So you can therefore not right. create I, peace. I, I, I point understand, made. but the, the point, point I was going to make was it is not a promise. As I understand it, what these letters are saying is, it's a kind of, it was a kind of nod and a wink to keep the peace process on track, a nod and a wink to a set, a, a set of individuals who were on the run. They're called on the runs. Why were they on the run? Because they were suspected of terrorist activity. It was a nod and a wink to them to say, and these letters said it explicitly, at this moment in time, there is no evidence against you and we're not seeking any evidence against you and there is no police force that is seeking any evidence against you. Yeah. In the case of Mr Downey, this was actually incorrect. The Metropolitan Absolutely. Police was seeking him. So yes. put that to one side. In general, they're saying, not in the wink, chaps. You can basically get on and live your lives. We're not coming after you. Now, the question is, is that acceptable? And I would say that, you know, um, it's not acceptable <coughs> because, first of all, Justice denied can never produce, I think, a just society. And secondly, as we can see, the peace is conditional. There is still a threat of violence. So it's, it's and, and the, the, the third thing is this, you say promises must be kept, and I agree with you, and that's why this case was thrown out. The promise was made to this man Downey. He thought on the basis of that promise he could come to Britain, to England, without a problem. That's right. And that's why the judge said, yes. you that's can't right. carry right. on with the trial. Right on but the promise was made behind the backs, as far as one can see, and I'm not sure Elvin was correct, well, behind the backs of parties to the peace process. Well, they would never have accepted Melody, it. Melody, she Melody if you'll excuse me, on the, uh, in April 2010, there was a meeting of the Northern Ireland Policing Board where these, were, uh, uh, these members, th this matter was raised, and at that meeting, there were three members of the DUP. Well, then they didn't right. discuss what it with others, and that does matter. Right. I agree R with Melanie but, on that. I just make one no, 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 hang on a second. No, I want to hear from Rishanara. Sorry. Sorry. Well, well, clearly a mistake was made in this case, and I think we, the review that has been announced today has got to look into this issue. But I know uh, that if I was a family member of the victims, I would want justice. But at the same time, we have to recognise that the Northern Ireland peace process has secured freedom from terrorism, freedom from conflict. And we've got to keep our eye on that issue because as a country, as a nation, we're better, better protected because of it. But the injustice that these families have faced yeah. need to be addressed. And that's what the inquiry will need to look exactly. at. Yes. All right. You said uh, in the black and brown jacket. Black jacket. Just one question here. Can we afford to put our troops in danger by making promises not to prosecute? Because our troops who are out there today, their families who are out there today, are we going to make similar promises with the government in power today or governments in the future? Are you against the promises being made at all? Uh, I think there should be no amnesty it. of any kind. Is it peace at any cost? That's what I'm saying. All right. I'm going, I think everybody's had a say, and I'm going to move on because we have many questions I'd like to get through. Uh, Jean Holloway, please. Jean Holloway. Is it not time that Harriet Harman came out and apologised for her links with the paedophile information exchange? <laughs> Melanie Phillips. Um, I think it's uh, a very a good development, what's happened today, that Patricia Hewitt, who was running the National Council for Civil Liberties during this whole period uh, when the paedophile information exchange was associated with the NCCL, has now said very, very clearly and unambiguously it was wrong, we were naive, uh, we shouldn't have had them as part of the NCCL, and I apologise. If Harriet Harman had said that at the beginning, there would have been no story. I mean, this whole sort of furore, I'm afraid, has been fueled by Harriet Harman um, going off the deep end, uh, being evasive, um, accusing the newspapers of accusing her of stuff that they hadn't accused her of, 
and above all, denying that there was a problem with the NCCL having the PIE as its member, as one of its members. Um, and I'm a little <coughs> baffled as to why, you know, she didn't just say what Patricia Hewitt has said today. It would have been an end to it. I think, you know, it is an interesting historical issue, and I think it has some relevance to today, that uh, progressive opinion in those days, and I remember, I remember when the PIE uh, was associated with the NCCL, and I remember the unease around that whole issue at the time. Um, but there was then a climate on the progressive side of politics, on the left, which was obsessed with rights. And it didn't draw a distinction between the rights of adults and the rights of children. And the whole issue of sex was mixed up with rights. Everyone had a right to everything, and children had a right. And the whole thing was framed in terms of rights. It, we find it very hard now, looking back, to understand this, I'm sure, but I, you know, I'm old enough to have lived through it. And it was a kind of madness. And I thought it was mad at the time. I mean, children, in my view, you know, don't have rights to sexual activity. We, as adults, have a duty to children to protect them right. while they're children. And this was the terrible confusion of the time. And I think that confusion has bled into all kinds of attitudes that persist today. Um, uh, we, today, have this uh, great um, uh, anxiety now about paedophilia. Um, then it wasn't called paedophilia. Then it was called um, love among children. It was presented in the most disgusting way. But the point was progressive circles accepted it because it was all bound up. And you see the paedophile information exchange gentleman, Mr. O'Carroll, has said perfectly correctly, because I remember this at the time, that, and he, he has said that the, pro the problem was not that Harriet Harman supported paedophilia, not that she supported the PIE. Um, in fact, she came onto the scene in the NCCL quite right. late on in this saga. The problem was mm. that it was mixed up with the whole gay rights agenda. Okay. And Jay people couldn't talk about paedophilia without getting in the, way of the gay rights agenda. <laughs> Look, if you, if you think that Harriet Harman, Patricia Hewitt and Jack Dromey back in the 70s thought paedophilia was a really good thing and they wanted to get behind it, then hold them in utter contempt, never vote for the Labour Party ever again, throw them out. Personally, I can't help but see this as just the Daily Mail taking its revenge on a bunch of people they don't like. As you say, Melanie, the 1970s was a, a strange time. God, you were on the left back in the 1970s, as we all remember. <laughs> I mean, my memory goes back that far. It, this isn't really about the rights and wrongs of paedophilia, which we know is an obscenity and obscene, and the way things were done in the 70s were very, very bizarre. It is about the Daily Mail, uh, the paper, and I'm just going to say it again because everybody else has said it, the nearest we have to a paedophile information exchange is dailymail.co.uk, and it's pictures of kids. <laughs> it's... it's was that, was it's that, a was cheap that. shot to say it, but it's true. And I just think that we need to understand this as another bit of anti-leftist, anti-Labour um, propaganda but, but was, by the Daily Mail. But, but do you... <laughs> you haven't answered the question whether she should have apologised for the links to the PIE, and is, it, is her reluctance to apologise because she sees the mail in the terms you've described as sort of anti-Labour... Organ. I, I don't blame Harriet Harman for not wanting to apologise for a story which came up in the Daily Mail after it had been in private eye many years ago. It's not new. There's nothing new about this. The, Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail, sees it as a great way to have a go at various <laughs> people in the current Labour Party. I th you go back to the 70s, there's lots of things we could apologise for. We could keep apologising. The Daily Mail, as somebody said today, could apologise for supporting the black shirts back in the 30s if they like. It would be childish to ask them to do so. OK, you say in the striped tie, then. This story's only come about because of the uh, Jimmy Savile affair. The investigations into the Jimmy Savile affair has brought this about. This is why it's been brought to our attention. I don't think it's anything to do with the Daily Mail. They might have made an issue of it, but it's mainly because of the Jimmy Savile case. Do you think it's legitimate to have raised it? That because of that case, there's no investigating <laughs> going back to that time, and this is why the story's been so brought so out bad. now. And a So yeah. is the panel saying the Jimmy Savile case shouldn't be brought about? I think the Daily Mail has done a good job bringing it out. Yeah. But, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, I do think Harriet 
Harmon has handled it very badly. I yeah. think she should just come out and sort yeah. of... You know, if she'd done all of that, I think the story actually would have completely yeah. disappeared and gone away. Yeah. Um, I think it, it says much more about our attitude. I think they're actually... I, I'm really not interested, if I may say, in the fight between the Daily Mail and Harriet Harmon, and they, they can sort it out amongst themselves, but I don't think she's done herself, no. and neither has Jack, Jack, Jamie done themselves any favours. I think it actually says far more about the, the enormous change, certainly in my lifetime, and actually during my time at the bar, I don't know if Elvin would agree with this, towards child abuse and paedophilia. Um, there's a much greater understanding of, of what, not just what an awful, wicked thing it is, yeah. but the appalling damage it does to children. And I've read some of those documents. And Melanie is right. You have to read some of these documents that actually say that there's not really much harm that is done to a child. I mean, it's just the stuff of just madness. Um, and the other thing that we now know about paedophiles uh, is how wickedly cunning they are. Mm. And I suspect yeah. Elvin, like I, has had the misfortune of representing... Uh, paedophiles and I can assure you I don't like to stereotype but I think we can yes. with paedophiles uh, they're, 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 the things that they do are bad and evil enough in themselves but their wickedness and cunning yes. the way that they will inveigle their way into the, the affections of a child <laughs> or a mother that they will then commit this horrible abuse and it is sickening but it is a mm. terrible perversion what, for that of that child as well what do you make of the the document the nccl submitted in 1976 to parliament which said childhood sexual experiences willingly engaged in with an adult don't do anything. result in no identifiable damage Appalling. i mean that was the nub of yeah. the case which which, which I, I, I think they haven't apologized for unbelievably disgusting to be honest and that's why and, she and, and, have said and there's no point saying the more is was different in the 70s it was disgusting then and it's disgusting Absolutely. now can I, can I just yes say yes right. yes yes yeah. yeah. come to the defense of Harriet Harman. I've listened very closely to what everyone's saying here, and it's clear that uh, PIE was a vile organisation that tried to infiltrate and successfully infiltrated NCCL at that time, and all the things that people have said here highlights the manipulative nature of paedophiliac, uh, paedophile organisations, paedophiles. But let's be clear about this. Harriet Harman has spent a lifetime campaigning for women and children she has. and their rights. And the idea that she would condone paedophiles is completely wrong and baseless. And there's not a shred of evidence to suggest otherwise. And that's why I agree with Jay uh, that uh, there is a political angle to this. Uh, there is a dimension, which is that the Daily Mail has got a campaign against certain senior figures in the Labour Party. First, it was Ed Miliband, an attack on his father. Now it's Harriet Harman. These allegations are baseless. Harriet has set out her uh, her role in NCCL, and I think that we've got to remember that when uh, when a paper goes this far in attacking someone. Uh, Despite her record, despite the work she's done championing children's rights, she that have, worries me she deeply. She should have said all these yeah. things. I mean, I, I pay tribute to the, a lot of the work she's done. I pay tribute to your last government, especially for the work it did on, on rape and, 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 and enabling children to give evidence and so on and so forth. And that's why I just think she's handled it really badly. But Patricia Hewitt apologised. And yes. she did. Sh she Shami Chakrabarti of Liberty, the, what is now NCL, apologised. Why didn't she apologise? Harriet has expressed her regret that uh, this organisation... Well, infiltrated. She took the yeah. job on two well, years David, after, after. With respect, affair. I mean, uh, there's a difference between Shami Chakrabarti, who is an officer of Liberty, which took over from NCCL. Uh, she has probably justifiably apologised. You're dealing with Harriet Harman, who at the time was a uh, fairly junior lawyer yep. acting for Absolutely. the NCCL. Now, she didn't act actually say, we'll affiliate to the PIE or whatever, but she was there as a lawyer. It would have been better if Harriet Hamlet said, look, I was a junior lawyer then, I had nothing to do with affiliating them, but it was a big mistake and I regret that mistake. But asking her to apologise is like asking me to apologise for the First World War. OK. No. Uh, 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 I'll take one more point uh, from the man at the back there and then we'll go on. You, sir, yes. Isn't there two points here? One is um, you put yourself in public office, you have to accept whatever's written about you. And secondly, you tell me any politician that will stand up and apologise when they're wrong. They don't. 
Well, the, yes, they do. do. They yes, don't. They do. Yes. Well, well, Honestly. if they don't, they They'll should. They'll find an excuse always. They will never come out and apologise right. to the public. Anna Subri, have you ever apologised? Oh, yes. Have you? No. no. no for no, for no, what? Re reassure him. What have you apologised for? I'm sure I have, because <laughs> I make so... You can't remember. <laughs> Because I make so many mistakes, sir. I have actually. What you said about I Nigel Farage, you apologise for that. I did, I apologise for We won't repeat what you said, but anyway, no. <laughs> <laughs> you did not apologise. Oh, repeat it, please. <laughs> no, I certainly won't repeat it. You're right. Actually, you wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we can say this across our party. Fair comment. Politicians do apologise. And could I just say about the Daily Mail? I trust me, they also say horrible things about Tories as well. Melanie's often said horrible things about me, but Ooh, you know. No. All right, you know, sure they have on, They haven't attacked right. the dead father of the Conservative leader. OK, sure let, 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 us, let us move on. Miles Allison, a question from Miles Allison, please. Has Britain lost control of its borders? This is, uh, has Britain lost control of its borders, presumably in the light of today's news that net immigration is up 200,000. Would that be right? That's right. Um, who would like to go on that? Elvin Cluid. Well, I don't think it's lost control, but um, we did think, uh, everybody thought that there would be an influx from within the European Union. There is free movement after all said and done. And we must also remember that uh, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, British people in other countries within the European Union as well. So it works both ways. But didn't actually. the Prime Minister say he was going to get it down to tens of thousands? Yes, he did. Then? Yes, he did. What's uh, gone wrong uh, then? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't sign up to his agenda. <laughs> And certainly, I, I don't uh, have any truck with the Conservative Party on this particular issue. Uh, I think there is room for uh, inward migration, and if we are to allow free movement within Europe, then it works both ways. And we do need people to come in and work in various jobs that actually uh, local people don't want to uh, take up. Uh, but to, to answer your question, <laughs> and, and, we, and we, of course, we benefit from it, but to answer your question, uh, it seems to me that there's something radically wrong in the thinking of the Prime Minister and the Border Agency. If he was thinking that it's going to come down to tens of thousands in the next couple of years, when it's actually gone up to 200,000, uh, just as bad as it was under the Labour government, you know, uh, and... Uh, you use the word just as bad. Well, just you, as bad in it, his terms. I don't, I don't think it's bad. You're in favour of it or against it? I'm not against it, certainly. OK. I, I think... Only the uh, use the word we bad. Have, no, well, I'm, OK. Well, if, uh, you are quick today, David. Um, uh, if, you know, if we are going to have free movement, then it works both ways. That's right. the point. Miles Allison, what do you think? Well, if you look at the figures superficially, I mean, paraphrase from UKIP, uh, it's frightening. But if you actually do the math in terms yeah. of the extrapolation, it isn't quite as bad as you think. Quite. No. The main concern, I guess, is that the South East is going to get clogged up and the infrastructure and transport is going to get uh, stasis. David Cameron's whole policy on migration, trying to stop it, was just dog whistle politics yes. to the rump of his party and its xenophobic fears about people coming over and taking our jobs and all of that. I live in Brixton in South London, which has one of the highest proportions of visible ethnic minorities, I think in Western Europe. I'm used to a city which has many, many nationalities. The great thing about people who migrate is they usually do it for good economic reasons. They want to work. Yeah. Um, and to come up with a really facile version of that, I'm delighted with the arrival of all the Polish painters and decorators because they turn up on time and they do a really good job and then they leave, uh, <coughs> unlike the British ones. The fact is these are people who are energetic and they want to be here and they want to work and they, as they end up working they get paid and they pay into the tax uh, kitty and we benefit from it. Well, as, as, as the daughter of someone who came here in the 1960s labour shortage, I think we, and you know, I recognise the contribution, the positive contribution people make to our country uh, and the strength in our diversity. And we saw that in uh, the 2020 uh, Olympics, uh, the best show on earth, and we thrived in our diversity. But there are major concerns about jobs, about youth unemployment. I see that in London and around the country. So what's important is that uh, we need confidence in that the immigration system is going to work for both our economy, but also making sure people feel secure, people don't feel that change is happening too fast. And that's 
that's a big challenge. And that means uh, we have to focus on making sure people who are able to work in our own country get the jobs that they need. But at the same time, it's a give and take. As, uh, as Elvin has said already, if we want a free and open uh, Europe where we benefit, 50% of our trade is with Europe, then that means that we will need to accept a level of freedom of movement between our countries, uh, both w people coming in and out. But that has to happen in a sensible way. We have to have a sensible approach to immigration. Can I just ask you what brought your family from Bangladesh to, to <coughs> Britain? Well, my father came here in the 60s during the labor shortage, during a skills shortage, and uh, As in what? those days, what was his work? He, he worked uh, in manufacturing, he worked in uh, the catering industry, and later on he worked, um, in fact, for a company uh, in the east end of London that made hose pipes for uh, garden hose pipes, which um, went b bust sadly after the um, but, uh, but ban on hose pipes. You, 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 <laughs> but you, you talk about you talk about the that you have to be careful about immigration. Did, did he find problems when he came in the 60s? Yes, he experienced huge amounts of racism. He experienced huge amounts of discrimination. And I'm really proud that we live in a country where that is ancient history now. Uh, and Britain is a much more open, much more inclusive yeah, yeah, yeah. society. Yeah. Yeah. David, can I very quickly point out that both Melanie and I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for economic migration because we're both the descendants of migrants into Britain. And me. Yeah. Oh, right. Subri. <laughs> Subri's a French. Yeah. Uh, Mel Melanie Fitch. Uh, well, Jay is entirely correct, um, but I think that Jay, uh, describing people who have concerns about the level of immigration, and I speak, as you say, as the granddaughter and great-granddaughter of immigrants to this country, I think describing people who have concerns about immigration in terms of dog whistle and xenophobic is a great insult to the millions of people who have genuine and Thank decent you. concerns about this. Because, you see... <laughs> You and I both know, and probably everyone around this table knows, that immigrants bring a great deal to the party, to the National Party. They have contributed enormously in all kinds of ways to our society for the better. But we're not talking about um, immigration in the abstract. We're talking about a situation where uh, if you have such large numbers coming in that your public services are simply overwhelmed, um, and as somebody has said, it's kind of bottom heavy. It's so much concentrated in the South that it creates a kind of economic imbalance. You simply can't do it. I mean, how many towns the size of Peterborough, whatever it is, have we got to construct in the next, in the next few years uh, to accommodate the numbers who are coming in? And the real problem is this. It's not a question of ethnic minorities. It's, a question of, it's not a question of wonderful Polish builders. I mean, we can all swap these stories. The issue is this, and it's a neuralgic one. It's to do with the European Union. The European Union's founding principle is the free movement of labour. The European Union is founded on the principle that basically national boundaries have got to give way for the greater good. Now, we can all have a discussion about that founding principle, but the fact is that the countries of the European Union um, uh, are variously in difficulties over this principle. Chancellor and Merkel said today in the Houses of Parliament, freedom of movement remains one of the greatest achievements of the EU well, and exactly. should be preserved. Exactly. So, so it's so not going to change, is it? Because exactly. you have to have unanimity to change anything. Well, this is the, this is the problem with being a member of the European Union. And Mr Cameron pretends to us yeah. that he's going to solve this while remaining a member of the European but, Union. But if he, if he says view, it's a dog whistle, you're whistling in the dark. Aren't I'm you? possibly... Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite sure of the analogy here. But I think that politicians should be honest with us. If you sign up to a club whose founding principle is the free movement of peoples, that's the rule you accept. If you don't want it, you have to get out. All right. There isn't an alternative. The woman up there on the right. Yes. I think Elvin Thode made a very good point that he said that people don't want to do the job that immigrants are coming in to do. Mm. If they don't want the job, they lose their benefits. Mm. It's as simple as that. So you've... Uh, uh, go on, who... No, go on, yes, you, there was a person arguing with you there. Yes, what are you uh, saying? I think we're sending out the wrong messages with these jobs. We're educating our children that if you start off at we, what we class as a lower job, it's not the right thing for you. We should be saying to our children, 
they're jobs that you can strive to better yourself, you can learn, you can move on, but we're dismissing those jobs as jobs that aren't worthwhile taking. What, jobs for Poles, in other words, well, rather no, just, than for you? No, just any jobs. That, yes. A basic level job we're damning as not being a good job, right. when and actually it's a job to move on a, from. And you in the check, check shirt up there at the very back. It's not a matter of people not wanting to do the jobs, it's the fact that the, the jobs are being advertised abroad and not in the UK. Really? You think... Uh, uh, yeah, I saw a job today that for... So the, 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 there, right? has, there has been a lot of truth in that. And we know that when, under the last government, we had completely unfettered um, migrants coming in from the European Union, that, that, that were agencies that were advertising, for example, in Poland and other countries. And one of the things that we've sought to do is to make sure that we don't do that, uh, that that, that well, is not allowed. Today. I saw adverts Just... today for theme park ride operators in Romania. Yes. How, how did you see an advertisement in Romania today? On the I went on a Romanian on uh, job site. Really? On the internet? Yes. But, but we also know, don't we, that it was predicted that we would be flooded out by Romanians and Bulgarians, and you will remember all of that. And some of you will have remembered the, the scare stories put out by uh, other political parties. Well, it's only been, and it's you only will been know that that has not been the case, because the reality of it is the majority of people, overwhelmingly, the majority of people who come to our country come here to work. And so you're unhappy with the 200,000? No, well, no, I was you're going to... You're not worried. Well, 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 let me just finish. Well, get to um, the point. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you just want me to get to the point you want me to make. No, I want um, to get to the point I, that the questioner had, which arguing. was, have we lost control of our borders? <laughs> no, I don't think we have. I think we've absolutely regained uh, control of our borders when it comes to non-EU. And right. we found that there's been a significant drop in the number of people coming from non-EU countries. And I think we've done a good job there. And I think, okay. in particular, we're getting rid of the phony colleges, um, which were then supposedly having people who were students, I think we've done that well. All what right. we have also but done, though, is we've made sure that we haven't had the supposed flood of immigrants coming in from Romania and Bulgaria. Those have proven to be <laughs> scare stories. The, the man with the spectacles there. Right. Yes. Uh, just two points. Yes. Uh, or maybe one. The, well, <laughs> all right. the one point is people trying to make out that the, the British youngsters don't want the jobs. I know for a fact, because I've got a youngster that does want a job, and he's got the same problem as this gentleman says. The British uh, youngsters do want to work. The agencies are bringing in uh, loads and loads of people from, from these different countries, and they are... Uh, working on contract to to um, these companies, and they don't pay, don't Jay, employ do them pick up on that point? You agree with him? Part-time oh, workers are I, cheaper. I, one of the areas that I have some expertise in is agriculture and seasonal uh, fruit picking and vegetable picking. And I've gone around farm after farm, and they say uh, they gave up five or so years ago because they could not get a workforce here, and that's why they now advertise abroad because uh, people were unwilling you, to do it. The or right, they turned up the and they didn't idea, want to. Do it. I'm sorry. My son has applied for three or four jobs. He's unskilled because of, because of his disabilities, but he can't get a job against, because the agencies are filling the jobs with Romanians and Polish and various other immigrants that are coming out. The agencies yeah. bring them what, over. What kind of job are you thinking of? What kind of jobs? Uh, I'm talking from? about unskilled labour. Right. Well, I, I think that that's partly true, if I may say. That is right? partly that, true. Is it truth, is, yeah. There is some truth in what you say, sir, yes. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But there's the other side of the coin as well. I know of many catering establishments in Mid and North Wales who cannot, for uh, love nor money, get local uh, people involved in catering. They don't want to do the hours. <laughs> they don't want to work for that particular pay. Seriously, I'm not making it up. And, and they tell me, uh, you know, the, the young people from Latvia, from Poland, come in, they take the jobs. Uh, uh, but I, I, they don't advertise abroad. I, I accept that, but I also... You must realise that these agencies yep. are... Yes, that's true. Uh, All right. By, you, ..buying you, the jobs up in bulk. Yeah, you, made, you made the point. And the, and the man there in the one, two, three, four, fifth row... I just don't feel that immigration is the problem. I, I think that integration is a problem. I mean, in this capitalist society we live in, I mean, there's a competition for jobs, and as there's a competition for customers, I mean, if... Immigrants want to come over and compete for the jobs, and that's fair game. No, I just don't think there's a problem with it. I mean, yeah. Missionary? Well, I... <laughs> no problem. I, I wanted to return back to the comment the gentleman made earlier about his son, and I see uh, 
every day I meet young people, nearly one million young people who are unemployed. And we need to make sure that we don't lose another generation uh, to, to without, you know, because they're not getting the help they need. But we have and youth on unemployment the, falling on, now, Rishina. On the, on the, way no, that near, over 900,000 young people who are still unemployed. And like the gentleman says, his son needs help. But I think what's important is that the government steps up and addresses this, but, this issue. Please, please let me, so, let me oh. finish. Um, this issue because otherwise you end up with this uh, false uh, if you like conflict uh, sometimes it's a genuine issue uh, I saw it during the Olympics when uh, my constituents young constituents were struggling to get jobs uh, and uh, the companies that were contracted didn't reach out enough to local people so we do have we have a government that needs to take responsibility and encourage companies to recruit locally first so you want to but stem the flow of immigration is what you're saying no, I'm not, I'm not you're, saying you're that. saying you want I'm, to stem the I'm flow saying, of immigration by encouraging saying, people to employ local labor first what I'm saying, so there would be no demand what, for people from what Bulgaria I'm, what I'm or saying is, Romania what I'm saying or is we have to do more to help our young people get back to work and at the same time, of course, we have to make sure that when we have, uh, when we're as part of the European uh, Union, we have uh, a responsibility for free movement of labour, just as right. our people can move to the between countries. But you, we sir. have a responsibility to young people. You, sir, and then I'll go to you with the story. I read with the young lady finish. <clears throat> My biggest concern is that every aspect of education, health, and everything is crowded, overcrowded. We can't afford to have all these people coming in here. Okay, and you, sir. Uh, with, 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 with a moustache and, and, and a beard, indeed. To be yes. fair, I think that you can talk all day about all these different stories about immigration. The bottom line is, immigration benefits this country. Yeah. I mean, you must stand on a panel where it's evident that immigration is a benefit to this country. 34% they pay more in tax than they claim off benefits. So you can scaremonger as many people as you like. It won't work. It will not work, because the real reason this country is going down is for the bankers who take the massive bonuses yeah. in this country and people who avoid billions of pounds of tax. Right. And, and, and the woman there in the third row, you. Why, with an increase in population, are we having a decrease in our health services? Well, in, in Wales, you have a problem with your health services. Definitely. You certainly do. Um, and, and, and the problem that you have in Wales is that you, you have a Welsh Assembly that is not doing the job it should be doing with your health services. target since 2009. It is a Labour-controlled Welsh Assembly. It is failing you. It is not spending the money. It's not reaching the targets. You have people on waiting lists. And I hope that people in the rest of the country look at what Labour does with the NHS, compares what we have done uh, in England, uh, and will come to the conclusion that the NHS, you can trust it in our hands because we invest in it, as we have done. We've increased the amount of money in England. We have increased the... Is that no, where but no the budget has gone up. I never promise you that. It wasn't, it never wasn't, heard of Mid Staffordshire. It wasn't the question. That wasn't on our watch. Since that we're there, oh, hang on a second, it's hang on a second, in England, a second. It's not hang on a second, wait, 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 everyone, we, that wasn't the question, but since oh. you raised the question, or since the lady there raised it, just briefly, from Labour's point of view, you're under constant attack in the House of Commons for what has happened here in Wales and the way that the Welsh Assembly has cut back on the NHS. What do you say to that? Well, look, first of all, the, let's look at the situation in Wales. Just over three million, this is three million people in Wales, and the Conservative Party keeps comparing the rest of the country with Wales. Now, there are clearly issues, and the Welsh Government is uh, uh, dealing with that. And, uh, you know, but, 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 let's, but let's, let's focus on, let's look, at, let's look at the context. Let's look at the context. Where there are, you know, I'm not going to uh, say that there, aren't, there isn't improvement to, to make. You will know better than anybody. But the fact is that under this government's watch, three billion pounds worth of reorganisation, a backdoor privatisation effort, okay. and that's, that's, they don't like to talk about what's happening in the rest of the country, but on this government's watch, the NHS is being decimated. Anna's party is responsible for that. That's and she, you know, she and her party constantly use we, Wales as the example. We have a so why, is, why, is spending, million pound cancer well, why is spending... Why haven't you got that in Wales? And right. the Welsh well, government has... Well, well uh, Shnara, I, I don't want to be unkind, but obviously Obviously, uh, I know a bit more about the Welsh Health you Service do. than you do, uh, and I say, uh, but I say that with respect. Okay. Right. Point, point number one: Anne Cluid, your colleague in, uh, in our colleague in Westminster, has said that at least six hospitals in 
Wales have disturbing, ha disturbingly high mortality rates and should be investigated. So far, nothing happening. In the First Minister's own constituency, uh, a lady was uh, dealt with terribly in, in the local hospital. Her medicine was poured away instead of being given to her, and she subsequently died. He'd known about that since 2010 and not done, uh, 2012 and not done very much about it. Now, the short fact is, you may say it's only 3 million people, but the 3 million in Wales... Only 3 million. Well, yeah, but the 3 million in Wales deserve as good a service yeah, as anybody else. Here, here. Now, um, now yeah, but the, the point is... Um, I'll, I'll just give you one, one statistic then, OK? Just a snapshot. For people waiting for heart surgery in England who waited over 36 weeks, there are 60 people. In Wales, it's 185 yeah. and rising. That's not good enough. All right, the woman here on the right. Do you agree with all this? Do you feel Wales is hard done by? Uh, I think the health service in Wales is appalling, and I too know about the health service in Wales because I've worked in it and I've been a victim of it. And it's absolutely outrageous. The length of the waiting list, the standard of care when you actually get into their clutches, my biggest fear is actually being ill and growing old, oh because it is appalling. And wh wh who, do, who, do you, who, do you, who do you blame for this? Why do you think it's uh, happening? Well, I'm not a great fan of the Welsh Assembly. I did vote against it, because I think that the money that was spent to build the Senate in the, in the beginning and the money it takes to maintain this structure with all the Assembly members, all of that money could be going into health and education. Yes, so it's a complete waste yes, of could I just direct this question at um, Roshanara? Um, you said it's being sorted out down here. If it's being sorted out down here, why are people being sent into England to get treatment? No, what, I, what I said was that uh, I think it's important that the Welsh Government takes responsibility and that this issue is addressed. But what's really important is that we recognise that the, the, government, uh, the national government keeps using Wales uh, in order to divert attention from the wider problem uh, facing and crisis facing the NHS and that includes an A&E crisis, accident emergency crisis up and down the country in constituencies across, uh, my, uh, across London where I'm based and there are big issues for the NHS. Has the money been cut in be, England? And people shouldn't has be... money, the money been cut in England are you saying on the same scale as it has been in Wales? Well the, the figures Wales suggest, lost 1.7 billion in the figure suggests the 10 percent cut in Wales and a slight increase in, in England. Suddenly. No, the overall budget of the Welsh Government, uh, Elvin uh, is the expert in this, uh, well, uh, Welsh, government, Welsh Government yeah. has declined it, significantly. It, now, that's not an excuse. It, What's important is that we focus on recognising that our NHS uh, and the staff in the NHS overall right. should not be attacked using, using but you, these but examples. Wales, but we need and e, improvements, of course. In, in Wales, and A&E haven't hit their target since 2009. You've said the Welsh that, uh, Assembly have, a, uh, they have the power to make a big difference to the we're, NHS in Wales, and right. they're not using we've got to come, We've got to come to a close. I'll take a point from you, sir, a point from you with the spectacles on there, and then we must stop. Yes. It makes me laugh, really, where you can sit there and try and blame um, the current government for the problems. In Wales, we run and strangle by the Labour Party, yeah, and it's, yeah. it's about time that Wales walk up and stop voting the Labour Party. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you're the worst space. Uh, and, and very briefly, I said I'd take a point from you. But it has to be quick, please. Yep, sure. I think we have got a lackadaisical Labour government happy to blame the Tories in Westminster, and we've got the Tories in Westminster who, quite frankly, don't give a damn about Wales because they're never going to get any electoral mileage here. We really need an alternative here. Oh, anyway. OK. <laughs> on, on which note, we've come to the end of, of, of our hour. Next week, we're going to be embarking in East London... And we'll have Michael Heseltine on the panel, Rachel Rees for Labour, Simon Hughes for the Liberal Democrats, Amanda Patel from the Daily Mail. The week after that, we're going to be in Nottingham. I don't know who's going to be there yet, but if you'd like to come either to Barking or Nottingham, go to our website, the address is on the screen, or ring us on 0330-123-9988. If you're listening on Radio 5 Live, the debate goes on, the question time, extra time. But here in Newport, my thanks to our panel, to all of you who took part in this evening's Question Time, until next Thursday, from all of us here, good night.
comic Stuart Lee and why we should think more about other people's feelings and a special guest appearance. This week follows next. Thank you.